He slows, Foyt tries to miss him, and Herdebees unavoidably rides up over Foyt's wheel. Herc hits the wall, and fire erupts as he slides to a halt. He'll suffer major burn injuries. It's 1964 at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. A car rolls onto the track that looks like it came from another planet. No visible drive shaft, the engine sitting sideways, and the man behind it? A white-haired maverick in a white shirt who chain-smoked cigars and had already outsmarted NASCAR's rulebook more times than anyone could count. His name was Smokey Eunuch, and he was about to attempt the most audacious engineering experiment in Indy 500 history. This is the story of the car that defied logic, terrified the establishment, and disappeared into legend almost as quickly as it appeared. Praise from the racing community because I think that what you're trying to do or what you are doing is um, uh, very, very helpful in racing. Henry Smokey Eunuch wasn't just a mechanic. He was a philosopher with grease under his fingernails, an innovator who saw racing as a laboratory where the only rule was physics. By the early 1960s, his reputation preceded him like thunder before lightning. He'd built winning cars for NASCAR, helped develop innovations that would eventually reach production vehicles, and earned a reputation as the most creative rule bender in motorsports. But Smokey had a problem with the Indianapolis 500, not the race itself he loved racing. His problem was with the establishment, with the rigid thinking that said, this is how it's always been done. Jim Clark had proven in 1963 that European technology could win America's greatest race. Everyone was zigging toward rear engine designs. Smokey Eunuch decided to zag. What if, he wondered, you could take the traditional front engine roadster layout and make it work better than anyone thought possible? What if the problem wasn't the concept, but the execution? What if you could build a car so revolutionary that it would make the rear engine invasion irrelevant? These questions led him to create the side oiler, or, as it became known, the reverse torque indie car. To understand Smokey's genius, you need to understand the problem he was trying to solve. Traditional front-engine Indy cars had the engine mounted upright in front of the driver, with power transmitted through a drive shaft to the rear wheels. The problem was torque reaction. When the engine spins the drive shaft clockwise, physics demands that the car's chassis tries to rotate counterclockwise. At Indianapolis, where you're turning left at speeds exceeding 150 miles per hour, this torque reaction actually lifts the left side wheels, the wheels you need most for cornering. It was like trying to sprint while someone lifted your left leg. Engineers had band-aided this problem for decades with suspension tricks and weight distribution. Smokey looked at it and thought, what if we don't fight the physics? What if we use them? His solution was elegantly insane. He took a Ford 4.2 litre Vait engine, the same power plant Ford was campaigning at Le Mans, and mounted it on its side, tilted 90 degrees. The engine sat so low that its oil pan was practically scraping the ground, hence the nickname Side Oiler. But here's where it got wild. He reversed the direction of the engine's rotation. In Smokey's car, the engine spun counterclockwise. This meant that instead of lifting the left wheels during left-hand turns, the torque reaction actually pushed them down, increasing grip exactly where you needed it most. It was like turning a bug into a feature, transforming a fundamental flaw of front engine design into a potential advantage. The engineering challenges were immense. Oil circulation systems are designed for engines that sit upright. Smokey had to completely redesign the lubrication system to work with the engine on its side. The ignition timing, the carburetion, the cooling, everything had to be rethought from first principles. And then there was the transmission problem, you can't just bolt a standard gearbox to a backwards rotating engine. Smokey designed a custom transaxle that would mate with the engine and still deliver power to the rear wheels in the correct direction. The result was a car that looked like nothing else at Indianapolis. It sat low, impossibly low, with a sleek body that seemed to defy the bulky proportions of traditional roadsters. When other teams saw it, they didn't know whether to laugh or be terrified. Smokey brought his creation to Indianapolis in 1964 with Bobby Johns as his driver. From the moment it rolled off the trailer, the car was controversial. 
USAC officials, the sanctioning body for the Indy 500, circled it like sharks who'd smelled blood. This was partly Smokey's own fault. His reputation preceded him. In NASCAR, he'd become famous for finding loopholes in the rulebook that made officials tear their hair out. There was the time he built a fuel tank that exploited the rule's wording to hold nearly twice the legal capacity. When officials made him remove it, he drove the car back to his garage on what he claimed was the fuel in the fuel line, several laps worth. At Indianapolis, officials were determined not to be embarrassed. They scrutinized every inch of the side oiler. Was the engine displacement legal? Yes. Was the fuel system within specs? Barely, but yes. Did it meet safety requirements? Technically, yes, but they didn't like it. They didn't trust it. And they certainly didn't want Smokey Eunuch to show up their established teams with his sideways engine and his cigars and his smirk. Initial testing showed promise. The car's handling in the turns was unlike anything Bobby Johns had experienced. The increased left side grip was real, the physics worked exactly as Smokey had predicted. On the straights, the low center of gravity and aerodynamic profile gave it competitive speed. But there were problems, serious problems. The oil circulation system, despite Smokey's best efforts, couldn't quite handle the sustained high G cornering at Indianapolis. Oil starvation issues plagued testing sessions. The engine would run perfectly on the straights, but in the corners, when you needed reliability most, the lubrication system struggled to deliver oil to critical components. The cooling system was another nightmare. With the engine on its side and buried so low in the chassis, getting adequate airflow for cooling was like trying to air condition a basement with a desk fan. The engine ran hot, sometimes dangerously hot, and then there was the vibration. The reversed rotation engine created harmonic frequencies that nobody had anticipated. Components that should have lasted began failing prematurely. It wasn't just one problem. It was a cascading series of issues that even Smokey's genius couldn't solve quickly enough. Johns did his best, but during practice runs, the car showed its Jekyll and Hyde nature. When everything worked, it was genuinely quick. When problems arose, and they arose often, it was a rolling science experiment that left Johns wondering if he'd make it back to the pits. USAC officials watched with barely concealed satisfaction. They'd always suspected Smokey's car would fail, and now it seemed their suspicions were being confirmed by reality rather than regulation. Qualifying for the 1964 Indianapolis 500 was a four-lap, 10-mile test where every second counted. Bobby Johns strapped into Smokey's side oiler, knowing they were attempting something that might be remembered as either genius or folly. The car fired up with its distinctive sound different from every other car at the speedway because of its reversed rotation. Johns rolled out of the pit lane, took his warm-up lap, and then dropped the hammer. The first lap was promising. The car handled well through the turns, the reverse torque effect working as designed. But by the second lap, Johns felt it a hesitation a slight stumble in the engine. The oil pressure gauge flickered. Third lap. The engine temperature was climbing. Johns kept his foot down, knowing that backing off now would cost them their shot at qualifying. The car was fast enough, but would it hold together? Fourth and final lap. Johns came through turn four. The engine protesting. Systems on the edge of failure. He crossed the finish line and immediately lifted coasting toward the pits as the engine coughed and sputtered. Against all odds, Smokey Unix's reverse torque experiment would start the Indianapolis 500. But qualifying and racing are different animals. Qualifying is a sprint. The race is a marathon that punishes mechanical weakness. Smokey and his crew worked frantically in the days before the race, trying to address every issue, every weakness, every potential failure point. Race day arrived with Smokey cautiously optimistic. Maybe, just maybe, they could finish. Maybe they could even run competitively. Maybe this experiment would prove that there was still life in front engine design. The green flag dropped. 33 cars roared into turn one, and Bobby Johns was among them, piloting a machine that represented thousands of hours of innovation and stubbornness. The car lasted 48 laps, less than a third of the race distance. The engine issues that had plagued testing finally delivered their fatal blow. 
oil circulation problems led to bearing failure, and Johns brought the smoking car to pit lane, done for the day. Smokey stood in the pit lane, watching his creation sit silent and broken. He didn't show emotion that wasn't his style, but inside, he knew the side oiler was done. The motorsports press treated the side oiler's failure as validation of conventional wisdom. Front engine cars were dying, they wrote. The future belonged to rear engine designs, to European technology, to the new order at Indianapolis. Smoky Unix car was an interesting footnote, a creative dead end, a reminder that sometimes the old ways die for good reasons. But they missed the point. Smokey never brought the side oiler back to Indianapolis. He could have, he was stubborn enough, but he was also pragmatic. The car had proven his concept partially correct. The reverse torque effect worked. The handling advantages were real, but the engineering challenges of making a sideways engine reliable in endurance racing proved insurmountable with the technology and budget available. In later years, Smokey would reflect on the side oiler with something between pride and pragmatism. The idea was sound, he'd say, but we ran out of time and money to make it work right. For a man who'd built his reputation on making the impossible possible, it was as close to an admission of defeat as he'd come. Yet the side oiler's legacy wasn't in its failure, but in what it represented. While everyone else was following the trend toward rear engine cars, Smokey dared to ask if the conventional wisdom was actually wise he approached the problem from first principles, using physics and creativity rather than following the herd. Many of the innovations Smokey developed for the side oiler found their way into other projects. His work on low center of gravity designs influenced thinking across motorsports. His custom lubrication solutions for the sideways engine informed future developments in oil system design. The lessons learned from failure are often more valuable than the validation of success. Today, the 1964 side oiler exists primarily in photographs and in the memories of those who witnessed it. Unlike Smokey's NASCAR's cars or his other creations, no complete side oiler survives in museums or private collections. It's a ghost in the machine, a might have been that haunts Indianapolis Motor Speedway history. But perhaps that's fitting. The car was never about winning. It was about questioning. It was about refusing to accept that innovation has a finish line. Smokey Eunuch understood something fundamental about racing, about engineering, about life, that the difference between genius and insanity is often just a matter of execution and timing. The rear engine revolution that Smokey tried to counter with his side oiler did indeed take over Indianapolis. By 1965, Jim Clark would win the 500 in a rear engine Lotus. By the end of the decade, front engine roadsters would be extinct at the speedway. The side oiler couldn't stop the tide of history, but it made the establishment nervous, even if only for a moment. It forced engineers to question their assumptions. It proved that one man with enough knowledge, creativity, and sheer audacity could still challenge the established order, even if he couldn't ultimately overcome it. Smokey Eunuch went on to build and innovate for decades after the side oiler. He developed the hot vapor engine that nearly doubled fuel efficiency. He consulted for manufacturers and racing teams. He wrote books and shared his knowledge, inspiring generations of mechanics and engineers to think differently, to question everything, to never accept that's how it's always been done as a final answer. The side oiler was a failure by conventional metrics. It didn't win. It barely competed. It disappeared into history after a single, unsuccessful attempt. But in another sense, it succeeded completely. It proved that there are always alternative approaches, always different ways of solving problems. It demonstrated that innovation isn't about following the crowd. It's about having the courage to stand alone with your convictions, even when everyone thinks you're crazy, especially when everyone thinks you're crazy. Because sometimes the most important innovations aren't the ones that win races. Sometimes they're the ones that remind us to keep questioning Keep experimenting. Keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible. They're the ones that inspire someone else, somewhere down the line, to try something equally audacious. That's the real legacy of Smokey Unix reverse torque IndyCar. Not in what it accomplished, but in what it dared to attempt. 
not in its triumph, but in its magnificent, glorious refusal to accept defeat before even trying. And that's a legacy that outlasts any trophy.